On behalf of the International Military Student Division, in partnership with the Command and General Staff College and the Combined Arms Center, thank you for joining us here today for our second of five presentations in the Know Your World Cultural Engagement Series for the class of 2022. First, a couple of administrative announcements. Please do at this time turn off or silence your cell phones. Thank you for bringing your children to this amazing experience. If during the presentation your child becomes disruptive, please do take them into the atrium behind the Eisenhower Auditorium. Due to the COVID restrictions, we will not have a formal reception today. However, please do stop by the atrium on your way out after the presentation to meet with the presenter and his family to receive a cultural exchange box developed by his lovely wife, Johanna, and enjoy what is in the box after you get home, please. At this time, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you, direct from the Kingdom of the Swedish Armed Forces, the Royal Swedish Lifeguards Cavalry Regiment, one of the oldest continuously operational units in the entire world. Major Hans Philippe Quenius. This is Know Your World, Sweden. Sir, ladies and gentlemen, most honorable colleagues, thank you for being here tonight and thank you for letting me the opportunity to brief you and present Sweden. But before doing that, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the following people. Mr. Eric Stafford, Mr. Sean Madsen, and Mr. David Bourne for all the support in preparing this brief and for guiding me in writing this script word by word. I, <laughs> I also would like to thank Mr. Jim Fain for the professional and hospital way he has supported us international military students and our family in getting settled here in Fort Leavenworth. And to my small group, for Bravo, thanks for being here tonight and thanks for being the best small group, at least the best small group with a Swedish student in. Finally, I want to thank my wife, Joanna, for all her support prior to this brief, but also for her always supporting me, regardless of what stupid product I dive into. So, before briefing you specifically on Sweden, I would like to start by saying a few words about the close bonds between Sweden and the United States. I am proud that Sweden was one of the first countries already in 1783 to recognize the United States as an independent nation. Actually, number four, just after France, the Netherlands, and Spain but the history of our relationship goes back all the way to 1683, when the first Swedes set their foot on American soil. And for a short period of year, Sweden had a colony in North America called New Sweden. A tiny settlement on the borders of Pennsylvania and Delaware, only lasting roughly 20 years before being captured by the Dutch. Thanks. Maybe more important for our relationship is that from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s, poverty made 1.3 million Swedes emigrate to the North America, and that's corresponding to nearly one-third of the Swedish population at that time. Many of the migrants came to the Midwest and specifically to Chicago. As a matter of fact, in the early 1900s, Chicago had the second largest Swedish population in the world, second only to the Swedish capital of Stockholm. Today's descendants of Swedish emigrants live across the United States with the most significant numbers in Minnesota. But there are also Swedish ancestors far closer than that. And all over the United States, small towns have classic Swedish names. Close to Leavenworth is the small city of Lindsborg, proudly populated by Swedes still celebrating their heritage. Please visit them and enjoy Swedish food and traditions. And they're still celebrating the Swedish culture, but to do it with an American twist. So most Swedish emigrants have done quite well. And a few examples of US companies founded by Swedes who emigrated to the United States are Walgreens, Nordstrom's, and Greyhound. But there are also many Swedish-owned companies active present in the United States today. And Swedish companies provide almost 350,000 jobs to the continental United States. One of the most famous companies is IKEA, with more than 50 warehouses in the country and you will find your closest IKEA in Merriam, Kansas City. So please go visit them if you're looking for some nice furniture or just some Swedish meatballs. So 
Now that we have learned more about the American-Swedish relationship, let's move on and talk more specifically about Sweden and what Sweden is. I just want to be clear that we're talking about Sweden and not Switzerland. So if you were expecting to receive a goodie bag after this brief with Toblerone, a Swiss army knife or an exclusive watch, I'm sorry, those are all Swiss. So what you can expect in your goodie bags tonight are Swedish chocolate, cinnamon rolls, gingerbread cookies and lingonberry syrup. And if the goodie bags would have been a little bigger and the budget more wide, I would love to provide you a Volvo as well. <laughs> so if you compare the size of Sweden with the size of the United States, this is what it looks like when Sweden is displayed over the Midwest. But more understandable comparison is that Sweden roughly is the size of California and Nevada together. So compared with the United States, Sweden is small, but for being a country in Europe, Sweden is quite big. As a matter of fact, it's the third largest country in the European Union. The country is roughly 1,600 kilometers long and roughly 500 kilometers on its widest parts. Driving from the south of the country to the northern part of the country is the same distance as driving from Rome in Italy to the city of Malmö in the southern part of Sweden. Even though Sweden is large, it's sparsely populated. Only 10 million people live in Sweden. And again, to do a comparison with the United States, that's the same amount of people living in New York City. Just the city, not the whole state. And as a matter of fact, most Swedes live in the southern third of the country and mainly around the coast, and people are concentrated to the major cities, leaving the rest of the country very sparsely populated. The largest city in Sweden is Stockholm. This is our capital, and it's famous for being built on islands. The capital counts the traditions more than 1,000 years back. The second biggest city is Gothenburg in the east. This is where we have our biggest ports, and Gothenburg is important for our imports and exports. The third largest city is Malmö. This is our gate to the continental Europe and important for its manufacturing industries, but also for its high-tech research centers. Except for those three cities, most of the cities in Sweden are small, typically just up to 40,000 people, very similar to Levenborg. So, what about the rest of the country? As I told you in the beginning, Sweden is long and narrow. The terrain is various depending on where in the country you are. The northern parts, mostly located over the Arctic Circle, consist of mountains, tundras, or wasteland, but also deep forests and many lakes. Up in the north, you find our mines and our wild rivers, giving us almost unlimited resources of iron ore and electric power. The middle part of the country is covered with dense forests stretching over beautiful hills. This is the location for most of our farms and our agriculture production. To use an American expression, this is our heartland and our Midwest. Even though our agriculture system mostly is based on small family-driven farms, it provides for most of what we need, and the forests in this region provide us with timber, contributing to our national wealth. The coast areas of Sweden are to a large extent covered with islands into beautiful archipelago. As you can see, Sweden has quite a few islands. Actually, most islands of all countries in the world. Many of our cities are located at the coast and often built on islands. And historically, islands were easier to defend and therefore suitable to live on. Stockholm, where I live, is built on a little bit more than 20 islands. And many people, including myself, regularly use boats for commuting. That's why Stockholm sometimes is called the Venice of the North. But the archipelago is also the place where many Swedes sp spend time off, and many use their motorboats or sailing boats to enjoy the islands, and we actually are a seafar nation. The archipelago is also important because it provides us with fish and seafood, which is a big part of our traditional diet. Since large parts of the country is located north of the Arctic Circle, a good rule of thumb is that Sweden is never particularly warm. On an average, over the year, the temperature in Sweden is close to 35 degrees Fahrenheit, or just over freezing temperatures. But that's on an average. The summers can be warm, with temperatures in all of the country up to 80 degrees. But anything over 70 degrees Fahrenheit is considered to be top weather, even in the summer. So, even though Sweden is cold, it's possible to enjoy a swim, at least some days, and according to some people, but don't trust us in this case. 
Most suites are not picky about cold weather, and most of us don't mind winter bathing. It's much nicer and refreshing than it might seem, and very healthy. And we usually combine it, the winter baths with the saunas. And saunas are very common in Swedish homes, and they are an important part of our culture. It might be explained by the fact that winters in Sweden are long and cold. The temperature can drop to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but usually stays on more modest low negative Fahrenheit. The snow normally starts to fall in late October and stays until March in the south and until late May in north. Stockholm, the capital in the middle part of Sweden, normally has up to 100 days of snow per year. The winters can also be dark. And in the northern part of the country, the sun is totally gone from early December to late January. But people in the north are compensated by the beautiful northern lights, lighting up the skies in green firework during the Arctic nights. When the sun returns in the late spring, the snow together with the sun provides a spectacular bright light with sparkling snow and blue skies. Swedes, regardless of age or background, tries to be outdoor to enjoy winter sports. The normal way of performing sports is in the nature and not in arenas or rinks. And many Swedes say that they hate the winter, but it's probably a lie, because most of us actually love winter sports. And as a matter of fact, the Swedish schools have an extra week of winter break in late February named sport vacation in order to sp support sport activities amongst the population. That might explain why Sweden is so good at winter sports. And in the latest Winter Olympics, Sweden ended on an honorable fifth place. Another sport fact is that not less than 72 Swedish hockey players were present during the Stanley Cup playoffs 2020. But Sweden doesn't only do winter sports. Soccer or metric football, or just football as we call it, is the most popular sport in Sweden. The second largest sport in Sweden when it comes to active athletes, and maybe a bit surprising, is horseback riding. And this year, Sweden won the Olympic gold in shoe jumping in Tokyo. But besides doing sports, the Swede spends a lot of time hiking, biking, or just enjoying the nature. The possibilities to explore the nature are almost endless. And due to the ancient Swedish law called the Allman's right, everybody, including tourists, have the right to freely move in the nature, regardless of who's owning the land. Even private properties are open for you to explore. You can even camp a night or two on private lands as long as you don't disturb a sabotage, and it's legal to pick berries, flowers, or mushrooms. In Sweden, trespassing is unheard of. If you enjoy the Swedish nature, you must be aware of polar bears, strong, aggressive, and violent, and they can possess a deadly threat to anyone who meets them. Just kidding, of course, there are no polar bears in Sweden. But we do have European bears, wolverines, and wolves. And neither of those animals are known to regularly attack humans. So if you're lucky to see any of them, enjoy the moment, but stay on a safe distance. There is, however, one very dangerous animal in Sweden, severely injuring up to almost 1,000 people a year and killing a few. That's the moose. It's the king of the forest. It's the most dangerous animal in Sweden. But that's due to traffic accidents. So if you ever come to Sweden, Drive safely and be aware that wild animal collision is a serious threat to your health. If you ask the Swedish chef instead, it's a good idea to better hunt the moose than hit it with a car. And in Sweden, wild meat, and especially moose, is staple food. So if you thought that real Swedish meatballs were made of beef, you're wrong. Of course it's made of moose. And it's traditionally served in mashed potatoes, brown gravy, lingonberry jam, and dill pickled cucumber. But traditional food in Sweden is more than meatballs. We also love salmon and crawfish. And I know you consider crawfish being something for the Creole kitchen, but it's actually a very appreciated part of the Scandinavian kitchen too. We just eat it less spicy. But we also love our pickled herring. And pickled herring is something similar to sushi, raw fish flavored by vinegar and spice. So if you ever offered it, give it a try. It's actually quite nice. Well the fermented fish or the surströmming, that's something else. Try to avoid it. Don't try it, I promise. It's not worth it. And if you haven't been born and raised with it, stay away. 
Some Americans try. They say that when you first open a can of Sir Strumming, it's one of the worst smells in the world. Well, let's not do it then. I don't want to. Oh! oh. oh. Broken the seal. Yeah. Oh! oh. I don't... Oh, God. Okay, nope. I'm not... Oh, oh God! Oh. Oh my god. <laughs> it's sewage. It's sewage in a can. Oh my god. I'm out. <laughs> can we leave? That's so bad. Oh, it's coming. It's traveling. <laughs> it's traveling. Oh god. Someone turn on the air. I have the worst gag reflex. I'm definitely going to heat. <laughs> yeah, so how does it smell? It's actually horrible. And I know it's crazy to be eating that, but that's part of our tradition. So uh, it's actually a little bit better with side orders and the complimentary drinks, and it makes it a little bit more tasty. Unfortunately, I didn't bring any fermented fish to the United States. It's not allowed to bring to regular airlines since it's considered being biohazard. <laughs> so don't fear, it will not be in your goodie bags, and I won't give it to you if you visit my home. With that said, if you are in Sweden or visiting IKEA, enjoy our cinnamon rolls instead. They're much nicer and tastier, and due to Swedish legends, it makes you nice and kind. But the best Sweden can provide when it comes to food is probably our smorgasbord. Actually, just a bunch of traditional dishes served together as a form of a buffet. And it's always served with complimentary drinks. Around the big holidays, that's what we eat. So who lives in Sweden and who eats the food? The first traces of modern humans in Sweden are dated back to 8,000 years before Christ or the older Stone Age. Around the country, inscriptions can be found on rock foundations picturing humans hunting and fishing. But this is not to be confused with the Vikings, who were Scandinavian tribes living in the north around 800 to 1050 AD. Unfortunately, the Vikings are so much cooler in the movies than in reality. So far, no Viking helmet has been found with horns, and Vikings normally didn't use double-bladed axes. Most of them were fighting with swords, far more effective on the battlefield, but they did have excellent ships, and they were fierce warriors. For almost 250 years, the Vikings paid regular visits to European mainland, spreading the Scandinavian culture, the language, and their genes. But the Vikings also were the first Europeans to make it all the way to North America. And even though their settlements didn't last long, they were 500 years ahead of Columbus. I think the United States should consider to add a new federal holiday called the Viking Day. All could wear fancy helmets, enjoy smorgasbords, and have a day off from school. Wouldn't that be neat? <laughs> the Vikings were pagans and traditionally tributing the Norse gods. But I would say that no Swede today believe in the Norse gods. But they are an important part of our history, and they still affect how we celebrate our holidays. I want to know, if you want to know more about the Norse gods, I recommend that you enjoy any of the well-made documentaries about the Norse gods that can be seen on Netflix or the cinemas. The movies of Thor, Odin, and Loke are all based on Scandinavian legends. And for me, it's a little weird that our mythology has turned into Marvel movies. It's cool, but maybe not always so accurate, but enjoy them. As I earlier mentioned, our traditional holidays are actually based on the Norse traditions and are strongly connected to the movement of the sun. In the middle of December, close to the longest night of the year, we are celebrating St. Lucia. She is the bearer of the light. By lighting candles, we are trying to defeat the darkness and fight the evil spirits of the polar night. Human sacrifices are since long abandoned, and even though they occurred 1,500 years ago, in present days, we are instead eating saffron buns, and consuming glue wines and enjoying the beautiful songs of the Lucia choirs. At the longest day of the year, we instead celebrating the light and fertility of the earth. Midsummer is by far the most important tradition in Sweden, but also the strangest. So if you ever visit Sweden in the summer, you must be aware of what's waiting. So please enjoy and watch carefully Midsummer. <laughs> to forget about Swedish minimalism and embrace our pagan roots. It's Midsummer, Marking the official start of summer, Midsummer is one of Sweden's most important holidays. This is a celebration you don't want to miss. 
let me give you a few pointers on how to get the most out of your Swedish midsummer experience. This is a day when we can let our hair down, laugh a little too loud, and dance like no one is watching. So, if you want to truly take part in the celebration, join us as we dance and hop around the maypole and do the small frog's dance. The midsummer meal is something we Swedes look forward to all year long. Pickled herring, buttery new potatoes with dill, cured salmon and strawberries and cream. Go on, dig into this summertime smorgasbord. No one's judging you. You might think vodka is our national spirit, but it's the flavored aquavit called snaps that is part of our holiday celebrations. However, just as important as the snaps are the snaps visor or drinking songs. Join in as we sing some of our favorites like Helangor, which means drink the whole thing. Skål. If you're still on the hunt for that special someone, make sure to pick seven flowers and place them under your pillow after the day's festivities have ended. Folklore says you'll then dream of your true love. <laughs> now that I've told you all you need to know to make the most out of your midsummer celebrations, you are ready to join the fun. Practice your frog dance, brush up on your snaps visor, and we'll see you soon. Well, fun, but a little weird. But most parts of the movies is in a good way showing a Swedish midsummer. So please be aware, or come and enjoy, depending on how you see it. Remember that you at least will be provided with an excellent smorgasbord, and the only cost for that might be some humiliation when it comes to dancing. So, even though we have a pagan history, Sweden has actually been a Christian country since 11th century. And according to the legend, the Swedish king got a vision of a yellow cross on the blue sky. Guided by that vision, he Christianized the people and adopted the Swedish flag as a national symbol. And this is making the Swedish flag one of the oldest national flags still in current and unbroken use. Since the mid 1500s, Sweden has been a Lutheran country with traditions and liturgies similar to American Episcopal Church. But for most Swedes, religion isn't that important. And Sweden is one of the most secularized countries in the world, with more than 70% of the population stating themselves rarely or never to visit the church. We do still follow the Christian culture and ethics, but the ceremonies are just not considered so important in our society. However, Sweden is moving in a direction of being more conservative and more religious rather than secularized. One explanation to this is that Sweden has seen a very high rate of migration from non-European countries the last years. Many of the new Swedish citizens are confessing Muslims from the Middle East and North Africa, and this has affected the Swedish society in many ways. A little bit more than 20% of the present population are born outside of Sweden or have parents born in another country. Some people in Sweden are protesting the migration and demanding a more restrictive policy. They state that the society has reached a limit for how many migrants the country can host. Some people in Sweden argue for a more open migration politics and want society to be more generous in giving out resident permits, and they also advocate for open borders and more liberal rules of citizenship. During the last years, there have been an increase in criminality in the society, and civil unrest occurs in some of the more socially explored communities. Part of that explanation is that we have fallen in integrating new arrivals to our society, leading to a somewhat segregated country. This is something we're not proud of. But it's also something we recognize in working to mitigate. And one of our big challenges for, is to integrate the present population and to ensure a good quality of life for all people within our borders, regardless of the country of origin. But we must also be sure to stand up for the values of the Swedish society and support people in understanding the basic foundation of how to live and be successful in a liberal democracy. We are aware of this, and this is our big challenge for the upcoming years. And as you understand, not all Swedish people are tall, blonde, and blue-eyed. We are far more diverse than that. 
but please don't ask me to present any numbers or statistics of races or ethnicities. By Swedish law, labeling people into races are forbidden. Another perspective on migration and integration in the Kingdom of Sweden is the fact that the head of the state, King Carl XVI Gustav, actually is married to a migrant. The Queen, Sylvia, she's half Brazilian and half German. That also means that the Crown Princess, Victoria, the heir to the Swedish crown, is a second-generation migrant. And for the common Swedish citizen, the King and the royal family are core symbols of Sweden. Nobody would consider the crown princess being not Swedish. However, there is also another important king when it comes to integration. Slatan, the king of football. He is also a child to migrant parents. And as in the case with the crown princess, all Swedes consider him being Swedish. So give us a little time to work with our migration, and it will probably be fine in a few years. And actually, our mindset is that Swedish is not about where you're born. Being Swedish is about what you represent and who you choose to be. Between my regiment and the real Swedish king, not Slatan, there is a special bond. The lifeguards are the Swedish household troops, and we are devoted to protect the head of the state, the royal family, and the capital of Stockholm. All officers of the lifeguards are wearing the present king or queen's crest or name shifter on the uniform as a reminder of their legacy. We are also wearing silver details on our uniforms to distinct our regiment from the rest of the Swedish armed forces. The lifeguards is actually one of the oldest regiments in the world, still in current service. We were founded in 1521 by the Swedish king Gustav Vasa and have ever since been the palace guards and the watchkeepers of Stockholm. This year, we are celebrating 500 years of unbroken service to the royal crown and the Swedish state. Since we are so old and also a bit special, we keep our traditions very much alive. One special thing about us is that we are still mounted, and we use our horses for God in the castle, and we're keeping our cavalry traditions alive. But don't be fooled by the fancy uniforms, our horses, and our old-looking weapons. We do a little bit more than that. Please enjoy the lifeguards. <laughs> That see through the darkness, you'd hide with me like the wind, we'd be wild and free. You said you'd follow me. So, as you can see in the movie, we are still very traditional. But the units are well battle ready, the weapons are fully operational, and a clothes change from blues and royals into carbines and full battle equipment and automatic rifle only takes a few minutes. Most of the officers and a fair share of the soldiers are military police officers, a good asset when doing military operations in the capital. For my regiment, the king and the royal family means a lot. But even though the king is the head of the state, he is not the sovereign ruler of Sweden. The Swedish democratic system is based on political parties representing the population in the parliament. In the present parliament, we have eight parties, roughly working in two blocks, one more socialistic and one more conservative. From an American perspective, all of the parties would be labeled liberal or left-wing, but from a Swedish perspective, the differences are wide. 
What's good with the park representation is that you as a voter can place your vote on either the left or the right side, but not necessarily on the extremes. And the Swedes have a very high trust in the political system, and very few Swedes believe that you must be protected from the government. Most of us actually believe that the government and our politicians do what we want them to do, but in cooperation with other parties. Another core value in the Swedish society is the right to live your life as you want to without interference from the state or any other citizen in the Swedish society as well as in the Swedish armed forces. We don't care who you choose to live your life with and we don't care who you choose as a partner. As a matter of fact, we don't care about your gender either. We believe that the most suitable for the job is the best candidate regardless of their sex. All assignment is open for all applicants as long as they meet the standards. Discrimination on gender, sexual, racial, or religious causes is illegal in Sweden. But for us, gender equality works both ways. We expect females and males to take the same responsibility in the society. And needless to say, conscription in Sweden is of course gender neutral. But gender neutrality also leads to an expectation of fathers to be present and active in taking care of their families and their families and the kids. The Swedish system guarantees all families 480 days or 16 months of parental leave per child. During that time, you keep 80% of your normal salary, but paid as an allowance from the government. Half of those days are reserved for the fathers. It's illegal for employers, even the armed forces, to deny parents leave. For us, family actually comes first. Another important value in Sweden is the right to free education. Schools are tuition free from K to 12 and participation is mandatory by law. Colleges and university educations are voluntary but also free. If you want to study abroad, the Swedish government will subsidize your education. And the applications to the school are strictly based on your grades from previous education and from selective tests. Money cannot buy you a place on a school in Sweden. You must earn your place by hard work or talent. And actually, the system is working fairly well, and almost 44% of the Swedish population over 25 have a bachelor degree or above. We also believe that healthcare is a civil right, and no one in Sweden should fear to visit a hospital or a doctor. People do not have any medical insurance, and they don't need to have one. The maximum coup payment for a full year of medical treatment, including medicines, are $200 a year. Our retirement system is also a bit different from American. Most of us retire at the age of 65. If you, want to long, if you want to work longer, you have to apply for it, but that's unusual. The retirement is guaranteed by the state, and most retired in Sweden do very well economically. So how do we finance this? With taxes, of course. And uh, on an average, Swedish workers pay 50% in tax. However, after the taxes, you don't have to save money for healthcare, tuition, or retirement. But something a bit more unusual about the Swedish tax system, and strange for being considered a socialistic country, is that we don't pay property tax, and we don't pay tax on gifts, and neither taxes on heritage, and taxation for financial instruments are less than 1% a year. And even though the Swedish taxes pay for a lot of social security, the Swedes could be lazy and stay home, but the situation is actually the opposite. More than 81% of the population between 20 and 65 are employed, and that's one of the highest numbers in the world. 
We believe that our social security and our free school system make people afford to educate themselves. And we believe that people dare to take risk in self-developing. And by that, people get the opportunity to become their best. And that leads us to being an effective and a very creative nation. that most educations in Sweden are for free makes you more able to take risks. It's also good for your confidence to feel like someone believes in what you do and think it's important. If you talk to any successful writer, it's not like the idea is going to pop up in your head. That's not how it works. The successful ones actually sit down and write between fixed times, three hours a day. You can be creative and very structured about it. And I think that's where Swedes come in. I think the whole society is built up in Sweden to, to support entrepreneurs and, and free thinking. And we have a really good collaboration between institutions, companies and university. You can learn from your failure and still create that dream to a success. And I think that's very important. So, as you can see in the movie, Sweden has successfully spawned a fair amount of international active businesses. All of the brands on the display are companies present in the United States today. And as I mentioned before, more than 350,000 people in continental United States are employed by Swedish companies. But maybe more interesting than the brands is seeing what the companies are actually producing. This is just a few examples of what Sweden produce. We do trucks, satellites, nuclear reactors, submarines, stealth vessels, jet fighters, state-of-the-art radar systems, 5G tele telecommunications, artillery, fighting vehicles, mining equipment, and fun games. So for a country with only 10 million citizens, we are producing a lot of high technology products. I think we're doing kind of good. But Sweden is also contributing with some music, and after the United States and the United Kingdom and Sweden is the third largest exporter of the music in the world. But that's mostly due to Swedish musicians writing and producing a lot of music to other international artists. A few examples of artists being helped by Swedish producers are Britney Spears, Adele, Lady Gaga, Pink, Kelly Clarkson, and Coldplay, amongst many others. Again, well done for a small country. Now comes the tricky part. So how do I transact from music to security politics? Not very easy to do naturally. But maybe it works by pointing out that ABBA won the Eurovision Song Contest in 1974 with the famous song Waterloo, saying that in Waterloo, Napoleon did surrender. And that's actually an important thing for Sweden because after the Napoleonic Wars, the border of Sweden hasn't been changed or disputed. Since then, Sweden has stayed neutral through conflicts and haven't been in war for over 200 years. Throughout the 1900s, Swedish foreign policy was based on the principle of non-alignment in peacetime and neutrality in wartime. And of course, Sweden never participated in World War I and neither in World War II. And one political outcome of that was that Sweden never joined NATO and of course never joined the Warsaw Pact either. However, since 1995, Sweden has been a member of the European Union. And because of a new global security situation, Sweden has modified its foreign policy doctrine. Nowadays, Sweden builds security together with others and regularly contributes with forces to European Union, NATO, and UN missions around the world. Our largest troop presence right now is in Mali, where the former alumni from CDSC academic year of 2001, Lieutenant General Dennis Julian Spore is the present force commander. And although Sweden isn't a NATO member, Sweden is a close and highly interoperable partner of both NATO and the United States. Sweden is strongly committed to strengthening its military and civil cooperation with the United States and NATO. Sweden also has a strong defense relationship with Finland, sharing air and sea surveillance, as well as supporting each other with air and sea patrolling. Sweden is a net contributor to security in Northern Europe, where the military strategic situation has deteriorated. 
This map presenting the overall scenario from the Safad exercise a few years ago, and it clearly depicts what the Russians were training for. We recognize that Sweden most likely will be involved in any armed conflict in the region. And Sweden has signed the European Union Solidarity Treaty, and we will not stand passive in the case of an attack on any of our neighboring states. So, how do we perceive the security situation in the region today? Since 2014, the security threats have deteriorated due to Russia's actions and growing military capabilities. Swedish Navy and Air Forces are regularly involved in claiming our territory and our territorial waters from infringements. But the threats to our society are more challenging today than they used to be. The threats are more complicated and they are spreading over all domains. Cyber attacks are regularly conducted against Sweden and it has become part of our normal picture. They are also in target of informational campaigns, miscrediting our social system as well as targeting single key leaders. But there have also been infringements to our bases and our military installations. The threats of today are more hybrid and they are more in the gray zone. Due to the strategic challenges, the Swedish government, with wide support in the Swedish parliament, has committed to increase defense spending by more than 40%. That's the most substantial strengthening of the Swedish defense since the 1950s. One step is to reactivate and organize new units and regiments. Another was to reactivate conscription, which was done in 2018. At the current rate, close to 7.5% of the youth in Sweden are called to serve between a period of time for 12 to 18 months. But we are also revitalizing our defense concept where civil and military capabilities are brought together under the banner of total defense. The total defense concept is the opposite of DISCA. Total defense is instead civil authorities' support to defense operations. In war, all functions in the Swedish society focus on supporting the defense forces in homeland defense. Due to that, the Swedish Supreme Commander is the general in chief. He directs the armed forces. He is a commissioned officer who has worked himself up through the ranks from conscript to O10. The government and the Minister of Defense advise, fund, guide, and of course, appoint the Supreme Commander, but the General runs the show. This is also due to our trust in Mission Command, and we believe that Mission Command starts on the political level, and it works its way down to tactical levels. The Swedish Armed Forces strive to work as a joint force, but, and with a comprehensive approach based on four strong branches. But each of them have their own speciality, and even if we try to work joint, they're also allowed a high level of tactical and operational freedom. My branch, the Army, is based on five maneuver brigade combat teams under the command of one division. The Army also has six special ranger battalions and, of course, additional combat support battalions. All of the Army is trained for Arctic warfare, and we consider the winter to be our ally and the enemy of our foe. Fighting in Arctic environment is our speciality. Our Navy, together with the Marines, operate from our archipelago. In protection of the islands, our stealth vessels contest the opponent on the high seas approaching our coast. Our submarines are considered to be amongst the best in the world, and they wait in silence under the surface, ready to oppose any challenger of our freedom. The Air Force, based on our JAWS Griffin, is designed for operating from our civilian road network. They have a highly optimized turnaround time, giving them much time in the air, and our jet fighters, together with air defense system, provide a sustainable air superiority over our own territory. Our 40 battalions of home guards are based on volunteers and reservists, defending their counties or their regions. They are equipped and trained as light infantry, and even though they are volunteers, they are under the command of the Joint Force Headquarters. With their equipment, weapons, and ammunition accessible close to their homes, the guards are designed for being deployed within less than six hours, and they're ready to face an aggressor in the terrain they know as their own. 
we are not preparing for an expeditionary large-scale land operation. We are preparing for an existential threat against our state. We prepare for large-scale homeland defense operations. We use our terrain, our climate, and our society as part of our doctrine. And we are ready to fight a war within our borders. We do understand that our brigades can be destroyed, our vessels can be sunk, and our airplanes can be downed. But we just consider fighting in higher echelons to be the first half of the war. Our soldiers are trained never to give up. And we are prepared to defend our country with all necessary means. So, to any aggressor who wants to challenge us, I want you to be aware our strength is not equipment, neither our fancy weapon systems or a first line organization. Our superpower and weapon is the personnel of the armed forces and their commitment to defend their own state and their families. We defend our social system and our social network, providing equal opportunities to people. We defend our right to live our life as we want to, without interference from any other. We defend our right to eat whatever we want, even though it might be fermented fish or a smorgasbord. And we believe that people become their best if we give them opportunities and that makes them willing to fight for their nation. We believe that the united population is unbreakable because they trust each other. And we believe the strength of our nation is our people and the value they stand for. Initially, I asked you what Sweden is, and this is what Sweden is to me. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's been an honor introducing Sweden to you, and thank you for listening to me. Please come and enjoy and visit Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Major Huenius, for your excellent presentation. You've definitely lived up to your military unit's motto of Poussin ne posse, which means they do what appears to be impossible, and we have to wholeheartedly agree. So, on behalf of the International Military Student Office, the Combined Arms Center, and the entire Security Cooperation Enterprise, we present to you a token of our affection, the coveted coin of excellence for your work that you have put into this Know Your World, and to thank you and to your family for letting us be a part of your experience through this impactful engagement. Congratulations. Please join me uh, outside in the atrium with his family to meet the presenter, and we look forward to seeing all of you at our next event, which will be Know Your World Taiwan in January, and the information will be out to you very shortly. 
please do go out and enjoy our cultural exchange box and play the ABBA. <laughs>